acceptable option outside the EU. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's question. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, later today, I have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. This week, the Education Secretary announced that he would be delaying his education reform plans because he'd received more than a thousand submissions and he needed more time, in his words, to chew them over. So can I ask the First Minister if I personally promised to write a thousand submissions opposing an unwanted plan for a second referendum, will she chew that over and dump it as well? First Minister. Look, on education reform, which is a really serious matter that I would have hoped all members of the Chamber would want to discuss in a serious way, we have had the consultation on governance reform. We have received over a thousand uh, responses to that consultation and it's right and proper that the Education Secretary considers all of those responses and then comes forward to Parliament uh, with our proposals on the way forward. Uh, but of course the Government Review is only part of the uh, reform programme in education that we are taking forward. So we have our attainment challenge now up and running. Uh, our pupil equity funding is making sure that from the start of the coming financial year, £120 million will be going direct to head teachers to help them with the work of closing the attainment gap. We have our national improvement framework in place. We are now publishing more data about the performance of our schools than ever before. And of course, from August this year, uh, that data will be informed by new standardised assessments. So I've made very clear uh, on many, many occasions, presiding officer, the priority I attach to making sure that we continue to raise standards in our schools and, crucially, that we close that stubborn attainment gap. And I would hope that Ruth Davidson and all members of this chamber would get behind us as we do that. Ruth Davidson. There we go, education reform on the slow train. But let's dig just a little into the education secretary. Oh, no, let's dig a little into the Education Secretary's claim that he's still making up his mind about some of the issues of education reform because I don't think it stacks up. Because two years ago, a charity called the Hometown Foundation submitted proposals to the SNP government to set up a series of community-run pilot schools across Scotland. They were told that they would get an answer soon, but they're still waiting. And then finally, in November of last year, they wrote to Mr Swinney, and I have the letter, and it says this. We have lost our patience with this whole process. It has been a series of false dawns. The Education Secretary says he needs more time, but isn't it the truth, as we see from hometown's experience, that the government has made up its mind, it just won't say it? Yep. First Minister. No, that is not the case. What we have said to hometown, and indeed what we have said uh, to other interests uh, here, is that these decisions require, rightly and properly, I would have thought, to be taken in the context of the governance review. Uh, the governance review was one part of our wider programme of reform in education. And when you have a consultation uh, with the uh, potential for some far-reaching reforms in education, I think it is absolutely right that we take time to consider the responses and to consider the way forward. Uh, that is what I would uh, think people would expect us to do. But as we are doing that, the other strands of our reform programme are well underway. The attainment challenge, as I said, pupil equity funding. And I don't think anybody in this chamber should underestimate, because I know no head teacher across this country underestimates uh, the importance of giving £120 million direct to head teachers so that they can decide for themselves and fund for themselves the measures to improve attainment in schools. Uh, Standardised assessment, of course, which will start in schools across the country from August of this year, further informing uh, the data that we now publish so that we know uh, in detail how our schools are performing, we know where schools are doing well and we know where schools uh, need to do further work to improve. This is an ambitious and serious programme of reform and instead of uh, coming to this chamber uh, and while I think Ruth Davidson has said in the past that she does support reforms to education, uh, instead of coming here and sounding as if she opposes what we're doing, isn't it about time she got back behind the reforms we're taking forward. Ruth Davison. The First Minister is talking about our delayed governance review and says that we all have to wait for it. But in their letter, Hometown told her government that they were more than able to crack on with their pilot projects without re disrupting the review at all. And what was the reply that they received from our government? Well, I also have that here. And it says that John Swinney is not prepared to do it. 
So the deal for them is that you sit in fresh ideas for two years, you then say that they have to wait on a review, and then you announce that the review has been delayed because council elections are on their way. The First Minister said, the First Minister said that education reform would be her defining mission. Given just this one example, who does she think she's kidding? Yep. First Minister. Well, I have to say, I, I, spent, I, I spent Tuesday afternoon uh, in a meeting with John Swinney and our Council of International Education Advisors. Uh, as I was doing that, I noticed Ruth Davidson was publishing a report on the Constitution. So I'm not sure I'm going to take any lectures from her on priorities in government. The truth of the matter is, it would make no sense at all, even for a Conservative, and I know common sense doesn't always characterise the decision-making of Conservatives, but it would make no sense to have a review of governance and then preempt the outcome uh, by deciding already what track we're going to go down. So we will consider carefully the responses to that consultation, and then John Swinney, rightly and properly, will come to this Parliament and set out the way forward. But as we're doing that, uh, as I've already said, we will go on with the other strands of reforms, uh, reforms that are already starting to see difference across our education system, empowering head teachers, giving head teachers directly the funding they need to make a difference and making sure we are able uh, to tell exactly how our schools are performing. Uh, that's the kind of action uh, I've said was a priority and the action we're taking. And of course, you know, we've seen just this week uh, a report showing that uh, in the last financial year that we've got this uh, information for, despite the moans of the opposition, we saw real term spending in education uh, in local authorities going up, yet more evidence of the priority that is given to education. And as I say, if this is so important, Important. I know how important it is to me. If this is so important to the opposition, it's about time they got behind the reforms of this government instead of continuing to come to this chamber and simply moaning. Ruth Davidson. If this is so important to her, why does she keep kicking the can down the road? And here's one last quote from the hometown uh, so to the letter to Mr Swinney. And let me quote this directly. This is really not a great demonstration of meaningful engagement with stakeholders or a good start in trying to empower teachers, parents and communities to achieve excellence and equity in education. And they're not wrong. A year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, the First Minister staked her reputation on reforming Scotland's schools. And what have we seen since then? We've seen literacy standards slipping, we've seen numeracy standards sliding, we've seen curriculum for excellence failing, and now we've seen her education secretary stalling. She keeps putting their referendum on the front foot, but she's putting everyone else's child's education on the back burner. Hasn't her government got their priorities all wrong on this? All wrong. First Minister. I don't know, I, I don't know about this whole issue of putting something in the front foot. Uh, how it appears to me is that every time Ruth Davidson stands up in this chamber, all she managed to do is shoot herself in the foot. <laughs> As I want to talk about education, and she just continually tries to shoehorn in dimensions of independence and a referendum. When, of course, the only reason there's any talk about that at all is the reckless behaviour of the Tories in taking us out of the European yeah, Union yeah, yeah. against our will. But let me, presiding officer, get back... Let me get back to my priority, which is education. Now, it seems to me that what Ruth Davidson is saying, seems to me that what Ruth Davidson is saying is that we shouldn't consult. Or if we do consult, we then shouldn't bother to listen to what people say. Now, maybe that is the approach the Conservatives at Westminster have taken, which is why they have a massive backbench rebellion on their hands over school funding right now, because they're reducing the funding that many schools will have. We will continue to take this forward by listening to people and then making the decisions about the best way forward. And Ruth Davidson says, and you know, wh wh what are we doing to back up the priority? I've already told her what's happening in our schools. Maybe she should get into more of our schools and find out what's happening yeah. in our schools instead of publishing papers about the constitution. What's happening in our schools is our attainment challenge. Our pupil equity funding going direct to head teachers. Standardised assessments being introduced to inform teacher judgments. More data than ever before being published so that we can determine how well our schools are doing and what more uh, we need to do to support those who work in the front line in our education system. So I'll leave Ruth Davidson moaning on the sidelines and I'll go on with my priority of raising attainment in our schools and closing the attainment gap because that's what I've said is my priority and it will continue to be so.
Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week? First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. It has been 10 months since the election, yet parents and teachers still remain in the dark about the SNP's plans for our schools. And as we've just heard, the Education Secretary has kicked the consultation on how schools are run into the long grass. And the First Minister said that that's just one part of our education reforms. And she's right. There's also the Education Bill, the very symbol of this government's apparent number one priority. It has been kicked into the long grass too. The SNP's power grab to centralise every school budget in the country kicked into the long grass as well. And the rollout of national testing, which she also mentioned, has been delayed as well. Education was the First Minister's defining mission. Isn't it the case that education is defining this government as indecisive and distracted? First Minister. Well, I think um, that question demonstrates that when a member of... Uh, Kezia Dugdale's own party after spending the weekend at uh, their conference described Kezia Dugdale as simply a pound shop Ruth Davidson. He was absolutely <laughs> right. Maybe more like buy one, get one free. <laughs> Kezia Dugdale has just said there, where's the education bill? The education bill is what is going to deliver the proposals from the governance review. And when we have uh, considered the more than 1,000 responses to that and brought our, forward our proposals to Parliament, uh, we will also bring forward uh, a bill, as we said we would do. Because Kezia Dugdale also said that we are, I think I got it right, we are centralising <laughs> education Bizarre. budgets. Bizarre. I mean, really? We're giving £120 million direct to head teachers in every single, almost every single one of our schools across the country. Giving resources and the power to use those resources direct to head teachers. Only in the world of Scottish Labour could that be described as centralising education budgets. It's the exact opposite of centralising education budgets. Giving it to head teachers is decentralising it. And what we're doing in our schools uh, through that extra resources is empowering head teachers to deliver what they think is required to improve attainment. That's building on the work of our attainment challenge. The National Improvement Framework, as I've already said uh, to the other half of the Act, is uh, making ensure that we have the data to track improvements in our schools. This is the kind of work we are getting on with day in and day out. And I say to Kezia Dugdale uh, what I said to Ruth Davidson, maybe they should get out a bit more into our schools, as I was yesterday, and see a bit more of what's happening in reality. Kezia Dugdale. The SNP government have failed for 10 years in education. No wonder she has to resort to personal attacks. That is beneath her. That's what we expected of Alex Salmond, not of the First Minister who's committed to closing the gap. And it's not just the lack of progress that's the problem. It's not just the lack of progress that's the problem. It's actually the fact that things are going backwards. John Swinney spent years cutting education budgets as finance minister. He cut over 4,000 teachers, 1,000 support staff. He cut 150,000 student places in our colleges. He cut university budgets and he slashed grants for students as well. Now John Swinney faces the consequences of John Swinney's own decisions. He was supposed to be the safe pair of hands. But now we know that John Swinney is fast getting a reputation for dropping the ball on education. If teachers and parents can see that the Education Secretary is letting down Scotland's children, why can't this First Minister? First Minister. True. I mean, Kezia Dugdale has come here week after week and stood up in this chamber and alleged that spending on our schools was going down. We had figures published this week for the most recent yeah. year that we have these statistics for showing that there was a real terms increase in education spending across our local authority areas. Kezia Dugdale's scaremongering on this has been absolutely exposed. Take universities. We have record numbers of young people now going 
into our universities. We are not just meeting, we are exceeding our manifesto commitment in terms of whole time equivalent places in our college sector. We are seeing the attainment gap start to narrow. We are seeing more people from deprived communities going to university, was in the case when we took office. So we are seeing progress because of the decisions this government has taken and the investments this government has made. But there's so much more work still to do, which is why we will go on with the reforms in our education system that will make sure we deliver the commitments we've made to young people and parents right across this country. First Minister gave the game away there, Presiding Officer, because she said in the last year the money for education went up. That's supposed to make up for it going down over the nine years that preceded it. And the reality is that she has cut £1.5 billion from local services since 2011. That's the truth she can't escape from. And I wouldn't want the First Minister to think that John Swinney hasn't been busy. He's launched an improvement framework, a governance review and an advertising campaign. He's just not done anything to improve our schools. And it's just not him as well. Since May, this government has launched more than 120 consultations and reviews. That's three a week. The Enterprise Review alone has three reviews within it. The Health and Social Care Delivery Plan, another four reviews within it. There is even a review into the review of fracking. This might make sense if this was a new government, but this SNP government has been in place for 10 years. Now, I know the First Minister has only one thing on her mind, but when is she going to stop talking about governing and actually start doing some governing? First Minister. Can I say, can I say to Kezia Dugdale, and I would advise her to listen to this, this government will never stop talking to and engaging with and yeah. consulting with the people of Scotland, because actually Labour, Labour stopped doing that. And they went from first place to second place in Scottish politics, and then they went from second place to third place, and who knows right now where they are going to end up. But let's get back to education. Kezia Dugdale, Kezia Dugdale comes here and talks about education funding. Now, I've got a very basic question for Kezia Dugdale. If she doesn't think enough money is being spent on schools in council areas across our country, why is it that there are Labour councils right now, after spending 10 years mourning about it, proposing to freeze the council tax next year? Why aren't they using the power that they've spent 10 years asking for uh, and refusing to raise extra money for education? That is a question Kezia Dugdale can't answer. But the other things Kezia Dugdale doesn't want to talk about, she doesn't want to talk about the £120 million going direct to head teachers. She doesn't want to talk about the extra resources through the attainment challenge. She doesn't want to uh, talk about the many things that teachers are doing in our schools right now to improve education and close the attainment gap, because that doesn't suit the narrative of Kezia Dugdale. Well, just like Ruth Davidson, I will leave Kezia Dugdale whining on the sidelines, and me and this government will continue to go on with the hard work of improving our schools. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer, because the First Minister posed a direct question, so it deserves an answer. For 10 years, the SNP have said that the council tax is unfair. The question isn't why Labour councils are freezing it, it's why the SNP haven't scrapped it. First Minister. Oh, for 10 years. <laughs> For 10 years, we have had Labour councils, we have had Labour MSPs in this chamber saying end the council tax freeze. So as soon as we end the council tax freeze, what do we have? We have Labour leaders in councils like Inverclyde saying that they're going to become the longest serving leaders ever to freeze the council tax. Labour doesn't know what it's doing from one day of the week to the next. And that's why they're in the mess that they're in. But I will continue to make sure we do our job Job of delivering improvements in our education system, delivering for the parents and the children right across this country. A constituency supplementary from Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I have been contacted by a local nursery owner in my constituency which looks after 133 children. So was the First Minister as disappointed as me to hear that the nursery will be hit with a business rate height of, hike of 65%? This will mean inevitable cost increases for parents and is preventing mothers from returning to work. 
First Minister. Well, we have introduced uh, a business rates release scheme, as uh, the Finance Secretary announced in this chamber a couple of weeks ago, uh, making sure that seven out of ten business premises across our country pay either the same or smaller business rates uh, in the coming year than they do now. Uh, five out of ten business premises across our country, of course, pay no business rates uh, whatsoever. But the Finance Secretary announced additional relief for uh, the hospitality sector and for office premises in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. And the reason we did that, of course, was to free up local councils uh, to use resources that they might have to provide any additional support that they think is required, which is why it's been so disappointing that Tory councillors in some councils have voted against local rates relief schemes. So instead of coming here and asking me that question, perhaps we should direct it to Tory councillors in his own area. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. I, uh, I think everybody in this chamber and everybody outside the chamber wants Scotland to be successful in closing the attainment gap in our schools. But that gap is not the result of merely one simple phenomenon. It has many complex causes. One of the most significant is the additional support needs that many young people have. And because of the way we recognise far, far more of those needs now, and that's welcome, one in four of our young people in Scotland is now recognised as having additional support needs. And yet evidence given to the Education Committee here in Parliament this week was shocking about the lack of provision to meet those needs. One in seven reduction in additional support needs teachers since 2010. One in ten reduction in additional support needs assistants. And the shocking uh, suggestion that a teacher in a Scottish school was told that in lieu of training that they genuinely need to develop their skills to support young people with additional support needs, they were told to go away and watch the Big Bang Theory. Was the First Minister as shocked to hear that as I was? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think Patrick Harvey is right to raise the issue of additional support needs. Uh, he's also right to say that we have uh, extended the definition of additional support needs, uh, so we capture more people in that definition to ensure that they get the support that they need. Um, and what we've seen, I referred earlier on to statistics published this week showing increased spending on schools. Within that, we also saw increased spending in terms of additional uh, learning support. But I do think there is a, there's quite a fundamental point here, and it may be a point of difference uh, between Patrick Harvey and I, although I would ask him to consider this. Something like 95% of all children with additional support needs are taught in mainstream schools. So we must not see uh, the support that they need as just being uh, support that they get from additional support teachers. Every single teacher working in our schools has a responsibility to provide the support that those young people need. So it's not simply a case of looking uh, at dedicated additional support uh, teachers. Uh, and that's why it's so important. Two things. Firstly, that spending uh, has increased in the statistics I spoke about, uh, but also that we see in, in most recent figures the number of teachers being maintained and uh, slightly uh, increasing as well. Now, the la last part of Patrick Harvey's question was in relation to uh, some evidence given to a committee this week. Uh, and what he has uh, just narrated there in terms of the evidence given would represent, in my view, a uh, practice that is completely unacceptable. Uh, but that's why the Scottish Government has supported development uh, of resources for autism, for example, so that teachers do have access to those resources. The autism toolbox is there to help teachers and educational support staff meet the needs of pupils uh, with autism. So it's important that we make sure that teachers are aware of that because uh, the, the resources are there for the training of teachers and it's important that they all have access to that. Patrick Harvey. It seems fairly clear, I think, to anyone who has looked at the evidence that was given to Parliament this week, that the specialists working in this field do not feel that teachers have access to the resources that they need. The, the Scottish Government is right to want to recruit more teachers, absolutely. But there have been concerns expressed by EIS, for example, that they won't have the time to develop the skills that they need to do the job that our modern uh, education system requires, quite rightly, of them. It's vital, yes, that all teachers have access to a level of training in additional support needs. And the committee heard this week that in the view of many people, it's less 
uh, degree of training provision than was in place 25 years ago. But we also need to be investing in the specialists uh, who can give the additional support where it's needed. And that specialism also needs to be an attractive and well-supported career path for teachers. So can I ask the First Minister, has she read the evidence that was given to the committee this week? If she hasn't had time yet, will she commit to do so very soon? And will she ensure that the next time we discuss this, we're not talking about the level of provision going down as the level of demand goes up and teachers being told to go and watch sitcoms? First Minister. Well, yes, I have looked at the evidence and I will make sure I study all of the evidence that's given to the committee on this issue very carefully. And if there's further action the government uh, needs to take, I, I will make sure, working with the Education Secretary, that we do that. But I do think it is important that we recognise, firstly, the, the trend in terms of investment uh, that I referred to earlier on. But we also recognise that this is not simply uh, a case of uh, teachers, uh, specialist teachers, important though they are and vital and valuable though they are. This is a about making sure that all teachers in our schools uh, have the training uh, and are equipped to support children with additional needs uh, in the way that they need to be supported. Now, in terms of the, the comment about uh, teachers being asked to watch the Big Bang Theory, that is totally unacceptable. Uh, but more than being unacceptable, there is absolutely no need for that to happen. I've already referred to the resources that are available. This toolbox is already very well used, but we will, uh, of course, now re-engage with local authorities to ensure that they're aware of that and are promoting it within all of their settings. Uh, we, I think, uh, do the right thing in terms of having a wide definition of young people with uh, additional support needs. We also do the right thing in supporting as many of those young people as possible uh, to learn in mainstream education. Uh, but Patrick Harvey, although we uh, might have some disagreements around the, the right way to do that, he's right to raise this issue. It's an issue that is of huge importance and an issue that the Scottish Government will continue to pay close attention to. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Now that she is thinking again about her plans for education, will she think again about national testing too? She told me before in this chamber that she would avoid league tables. Has she kept that promise? First Minister. We don't publish league tables and we will not publish uh, league tables. Uh, Willie Rennie asked me if I will change my mind on national testing. No, I won't change my mind on national testing. I don't support national testing uh, and we're not going to introduce national testing. What we are introducing is standardised assessment that will be used to help uh, well, the teachers and uh, the professionals here understand very well the distinction between the two. I suggest Willie Rennie might want to talk to one of them uh, to educate himself a bit more uh, on that distinction. But standardised assessments will inform the judgments teachers make right now about whether or not a young person is meeting the required level of curriculum for excellence. And I think it's really important, and this is perhaps just a fundamental disagreement that Willie Rennie and I have, I think it's important that a teacher, uh, as well as all the other judgments they bring to bear do have an objective source of information to inform that judgment. So we will continue uh, to introduce standardised assessment and of course we will continue to publish the data that I think all parents uh, and indeed all members of this chamber have a right to see. Uh, how are our schools doing in terms of the performance of young people against the required levels of care at for excellence? Because if we don't know that, how do we know whether we're doing well or whether we need to do better? Uh, the worst thing any First Minister or any government could allow to continue is some kind of flying blind situation where we just hope we're doing the right things. I want to make sure we've got the information to make sure we're doing the right things. Willie Rennie. Well, the First Minister is wrong. We already have national school league tables. We've got the information here. Every local authority, every school, every test result, it's published by the Scottish Government, her own government, that's published this information on experimental information. National school league tables. She promised that would never ever happen, but that's exactly what is happening. The National Institute for Education, they have made it clear that they've said standardised testing crushes creativity, both for learners and for teachers, does not take full account of pupil progress and causes unnecessary stress for the children and young people who are subjected to it. Is it not time that she abandoned the, abandoned the implementation of national testing last brought in by Michael Forsyth under Margaret Thatcher's regime. 
Isn't it about time the First Minister recognised that she has got this wrong? First Minister. No, I think Willie Rennie is 100% wrong on this. He's 100% wrong on lots of things, but he's certainly 100% wrong uh, on this. And I, I would go further than that, actually. I think Willie Rennie, uh, perhaps inadvertently, but I suspect not, is trying to mislead people about what is happening through standardised assessments. I know exactly what the Scottish Government uh, is publishing. Uh, we're not publishing league tables, uh, and we won't publish league tables where we rank schools in terms of the performance. But what we are publishing and what we will continue to publish, and I make absolutely no apology for this, is information that tells us, school by school, uh, how young people are performing. Because, do you know what? I think parents, I think teachers, I think those of us who are accountable for the education system have a right to know that. Because if we don't know, for example, what percentage of our young people in primary four uh, are meeting or not meeting the required level of curriculum for excellence, how then are we supposed to take the action uh, to put it right if things are not as good as they should be? Uh, how are we supposed to take the action before that young person gets further into school when it becomes too late uh, to rectify it? So I make no apology for this. I think parents have a right to know how their young person is doing and I think those of us uh, who have the responsibility for policy making in education need to know that as well. <laughs> it's not national testing, it's standardised assessment to inform teacher judgment. And I said once before uh, to Willie Rennie when he raised this, when we had the last meeting of the Council of Education Advisors, uh, Larry Flanagan of the EIS actually gave uh, what I thought was the best articulation that I'd heard of the difference between testing and assessments. So perhaps Willie Rennie uh, should talk to him. It's standardised assessment to inform teacher judgment and it's information that frankly we should be publishing to allow us to know uh, whether or not we are doing as we should be doing by the young people of this country and I will never ever make any apology for that. Point of order at the end of First Minister's questions. At the end of First Minister's questions please. Uh, Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister agreed in December with concerns about the openness and transparency of the Scottish Police Authority. Now, a member of that authority has resigned, reportedly because of the reaction to her having dared to raise a dissenting voice about the way it conducts its business. This morning, at the Public Audit Committee, a Scottish Government official said on this matter it requires further discussion. But does the First Minister agree that it's not further discussion that's needed, but for the Scottish Government to tell Andrew Flanagan that his damaging governance review is failing the SBA, failing Police Scotland and failing the public? And what will the Scottish Government do to ensure this vital scrutiny body can become proportionate, accountable and transparent as required by the Police and Fire Reform Act? First Minister. Well, I'm... The, the, the Governor's review, of course, is about improving uh, governance and accountability and transparency. I'm very clear that decisions taken by the Scottish Police Authority should be uh, made in public session and that papers and agendas for those sessions should be available uh, to the public and indeed uh, to the media. Uh, the member will be aware, or uh, certainly should be aware, that uh, in January uh, there was uh, a report uh, that Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary would inspect uh, the Police Authority uh, during 2017-18. Uh, that will be the first such inspection since uh, the SPA was established and it will look at uh, not just the state, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the body, uh, but also specific areas of focus will uh, be around uh, the transparency and effectiveness uh, of the way they do their business as well. So I would hope all members would welcome that. But transparency and accountability is vital. And I say again what I've said in this chamber before, the Scottish Police Authority must make sure they operate in line with those principles. And Marie Todd. Today's Times reports, um, not just a Westminster power grab on devolved matters such as farming and fisheries, but a cash grab too. Can I ask the First Minister for her reaction to these latest Tory attempts to undermine and weaken this Parliament? First Minister. Well, we do uh, have two important revelations, I think, from Ruth Davidson in this morning's editions of The Time. Uh, firstly, she seems to suggest that in areas uh, where Westminster currently has no power over Scotland at all, for example, agriculture, they intend to use Brexit to seize such power. Uh, clear undermining of the devolution settlement if ever uh, there was such a thing. And on money, instead of Scotland getting its fair share of any savings that Westminster makes by no longer having to pay EU contributions, Ruth Davidson's suggestion seems to be that the Treasury should keep all of that money 
and that the Scottish Government should be left to raise taxes in order to fund farm payments. That is absolutely outrageous and completely unacceptable. And I hope before the day is out, the Tories will have clarified this and make sure that A, there will be no power grab and B, there will be no cash grab on the Scottish Government by the Westminster Government. Now, I don't know, I, I really don't know whether this morning's interview was just inept or whether it was a window into the thinking of Westminster, or probably both actually. But I tell you what's clear, Westminster has got no intentions of giving new powers to this Parliament. All they want to do is muscle in on the powers we already have. And finally in this section, Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you. Presiding officer, um, last weekend the First Minister was quick to respond to comments made about nationalism by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, at the Scottish Labour Conference in Perth. She described these as spectacularly ill-judged and an insult. Presiding officer, according to last Friday's Perthshire Advertiser, the Deputy Leader of the SNP Administration on Perth and Kinross Council, Councillor Dave Dugan, until recently employed by the Deputy First Minister John Swinney, told councillors the following. Let us not reflect on concerns that we have been under the heel of foreign influence and power for 300 years. The island of Britain is no longer subject to the actions of Quislings, who may seek to see smaller cultures extinguished on an island of coffins by red coats. Presiding officer, given the First Minister's comments about Sadiq Khan's language, does she believe that Councillor Dugan's comments were appropriate, or does she apply one standard to members of other parties and a different standard to members of her own. No, I, I apply the same standard to everybody. Let me be very clear. Uh, I condemn any comments or any language, no matter uh, who it's from, uh, that is in any way, shape or form racist or anti English or in any way seeks to divide people on the basis of their ethnicity. That's not what my party or my movement, the, the movement I am part of, uh, is for or represents. But let me also say this and ask people to reflect on this quite carefully. Right now, in the United Kingdom, the SNP, the Scottish Government and the wider independence movement is right now amongst the loudest voices in the UK for diversity, for tolerance, for freedom of movement. The loudest voices standing up for the benefits of migration. We still have a Tory government that will not even guarantee the rights of EU nationals to live here. That is what is disgraceful. So I will practice the values that I hold dear and I would expect everybody to do likewise. Question five, Christine Graham. Christine oh, Graham. I didn't hear you. Ah, right. Uh, to ask the First Minister what measures the Scottish Government will take to ensure that there is appropriate social housing to meet the requirements of disabled, vulnerable and frail older people. First Minister. Well, we're committed to expanding social housing in communities across Scotland. That's why 35,000 of our 50,000 affordable homes target will be for social rent. Uh, good social housing is important for disabled, vulnerable and frail older people and the homes delivered through this programme will match Council's local housing strategies. We will shortly publish a refreshed age, home and community strategy which will take account of changing needs and demographics and help address issues of isolation that older people can face as well as improving access to suitable housing. I thank the First Minister for a reply and while the integration of health and social care to help people stay at home instead of hospital is welcome, it hits the buffers if appropriate housing is in short supply. Notwithstanding what the First Minister has just said, is she aware of recent, a recent report highlighting the dearth of sheltered and very sheltered housing, especially for the frail elderly, calling for a commission to consider and report on long-term funding and the provision of supported accommodation. Will the First Minister commit to that? First Minister. Uh, yes, indeed. I, th I think it is important that we have that uh, strat strategic approach in place, but also uh, that we commit to sustainable funding as well. I mean, we share the concerns that the housing sector has right now about uh, the UK government's changes to funding for supported accommodation. Um, and that's part of a, a broader approach to welfare cuts that is having a considerable impact on people across the country. So we will very carefully consider the recently published report on the effective supply of supported housing and we'll look at its recommendations, including setting up a commission to ensure that older people can access
address the housing and support that they need. Uh, and we're also absolutely committed to working with the sector to protect the most vulnerable and also ensure that supported accommodation is put on a sustainable and secure financial footing. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that sports funding is set for a 20% reduction over the next three years, which has been described by Sports Scotland as heartbreaking. First Minister. Well, the Sport and Active Living Budget has not been set beyond 2017-18, but I am happy to confirm that we have no plans to reduce it by 20% uh, by 2019-20. Uh, we're providing Sport Scotland with as much flexibility as possible within what I think we all accept is a tight settlement, uh, and we want to give them that flexibility, uh, not least in light of projected reductions in lottery funding in the coming years, and the Sports Minister has written to the UK Government seeking to address that issue, and I hope uh, Mr Whittle will give uh, her his support in doing so. Of course, beyond the core sport budget, we're also working to increase support to uh, active living. For example, since 2010, we've increased the budget for active travel to encourage more walking and cycling by 116%, uh, from £18.1 million pounds to £39.2 million pounds in 2016 and 17. So we will ensure that we continue uh, to deliver the policies and the funding uh, to support people to live as healthily and as actively as possible. Brian Whittle. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but this decimation of the sports budget along with the major cut in council funding means more of those in challenging circumstances will find sport and activity out of their reach. You see, people are not just entries on Derek Mackay's balance sheet. Attempting to save money this way delivers outcomes requiring interventions far costlier than the savings the government are attempting to make. This kind of policy will not tackle health inequality. It will drive it. Can I respectfully ask the First Minister, will she please take another look at this issue because the potential damage to sport, activity, the third sector and therefore communities will take years to repair? First Minister. We will continue to work with Sport Scotland, with governing bodies and with everybody with an interest both in sport and active living uh, to make sure that we are making the right investments. We have invested heavily in sport over uh, recent years and we will continue to invest heavily in sport, not just at the elite end of sport, but in community and grassroots sport as well. That's why the legacy of the Commonwealth Games, a community hubs being established in many parts of Scotland was so uh, vitally important. And as I said in my uh, initial answer, we will also invest in uh, the wider landscape to ensure that we are promoting active travel, encouraging people to walk more. One of the things I think is uh, most fantastic about what we're doing in our schools just now is the Daily Mile, supporting uh, schools to have the Daily Mile. So we will continue uh, to make sure that we work closely with all of those with an interest uh, to support those aspirations. Uh, and I would you know, can simply say to Brian Whittle, and I would be equally respectful uh, in return, we have a situation where uh, we are uh, seeing real terms uh, cuts in our budgets because of decisions taken at Westminster and in this parliament we also have well but we also have a situation that when we made a different decision on the higher rate of tax to try to protect public services the Conservatives uh, opposed that as well they instead wanted us to see us give a hefty tax cut to the top 10 percent of income earners so it's not enough week after week for Tories to come to this chamber and request more spending on this, that and the other if they are also asking us to deliver tax cuts for the wealthiest in our society. So I think it's about time they decided what their position actually was. And when they decide that, then they'll have a bit more credibility raising these issues in this chamber. Question number seven, Martin Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how many children the measures in the Child Poverty Bill will lift out of poverty by May 2021. First Minister. Uh, the Child Poverty Bill will require ministers to meet four targets uh, by 2030. These are uh, fewer than 10% of children living in relative poverty, fewer than 5% of children in absolute poverty, fewer than 5% of children in combined low income and material deprivation, and fewer than 5% of children in persistent poverty. Uh, the bill, of course, will make Scotland the only part of the UK with statutory targets to reduce and ultimately eradicate child poverty. However, and this is an important point, it's not targets in themselves that will reduce child poverty, it's the policy and action we take. And that's why the bill also requires the government to have a child poverty delivery plan with specific measures to lift children out of poverty. And the first plan will be published next year and then updated every five years. Mark Griffin. With the First Minister, that we do need action and not just targets. Labour lifted 120,000 children in Scotland out of poverty in government while 
um, by lifting incomes, not just setting targets. We are ready to make the Child Poverty Bill a success. That's why we backed the calls by the Child Poverty Action Group and Civic Scotland to top up child benefit for families in Scotland and to take thousands of kids out of poverty. And I think if the Scottish Government has any hope of making its Child Poverty Bill a success, it has to give that bill some teeth and start using the powers of this Parliament. So can I ask the First Minister, will the Government support Child Poverty Action Group and Civic Scotland's call to top up child benefit? And will you do it by making sure the Child Poverty Bill can deliver that increase now? Firstly, firstly, we will always uh, seek to have a close dialogue uh, with Child Poverty Action Group. It was the Child Poverty Action Group, amongst other uh, organisations, of course, that asked us to extend the provision of free school meals, something this government did, and I seem to remember Labour voted against in this chamber. Uh, we've already also brought forward plans uh, to use the additional powers that will come to this parliament uh, to introduce a Best Start grant where we will uh, target resources on low-income families, uh, giving an enhanced grant to parents when a child is born, uh, for every child that is born, not just for the first child, and then payments uh, during that child's uh, childhood when they go to nursery and then again when they go to school. So we've already set out clear plans about how we're going to increase the incomes of those families with children who most uh, need it. Of course, we'll continue to talk to others, the Child Poverty Action Group, other organisations and other interests across this chamber about what further action we can take uh, to tackle child poverty. Uh, but I hope this is an area where we can all uh, agree that, uh, and I do agree with Mark Griffin, that targets are important uh, and that's why it is important that they're in this bill, but it's the policies we introduce that will make the biggest difference. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions and a point of order from Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A few minutes ago, the First Minister accused um, a member of this Parliament of deliberately misleading Parliament. Now, Presiding Officer, you know, you know, as well as every other member of this Parliament knows what that phrase actually means. And I was wondering whether you could advise us whether the First Minister will be given an opportunity at some point to withdraw her remarks? Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. Yes, I did hear the remark, and uh, I did consider it at the time. In, in this particular case, I would just ask all members, all members, to treat each other respectfully, be careful about the language, but in this case, it was not an un use of unparliamentary language. We move on to uh, members' business. Fulton McGregor, I believe. We just take a few minutes to change seats.